Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to talk about um, the Oxford Institute of Aging, and then I'm going to talk about what we call the PCAP Centre, which is what we're going to be using the next um, three years' money for. Um, you've just heard about something that the UN has defined as the world's greatest challenge, which is global climate change and those kind of impacts. I'm going to talk on what the UN defines as the second great challenge for the 21st century, and that is global population aging. And I'm going to start by giving you some uh, pretty pictures, which really puts the demography in some kind of perspective, and then about the research that we do at the Oxford Institute of Aging, and then finally about our new project. Okay, this is um, the demography, uh, and we are demographers and statisticians, that's what run underlines the Institute of Aging. This is the percentage of population that's going to be aged over 60 by 2050, and if you look at the green, you can see that all the OECD countries plus uh, are actually going to have over a third of their population aged over 60. Uh, we're going to have um, approximately the purple and the pink, that's between a fifth and a quarter of the population, and it's only sub-Saharan Africa that will still have less than 10% of its population aged over 60. This is not about longevity, it is about falling fertility. Falling fertility, increasing longevity, driving the average age of the population up. As a consequence, we now have what we call mature societies. That's where the percentage of dependents uh, over 60 are greater than the dependents uh, under 15. Europe became mature in the year 2000. What people don't realize is that Asia will become mature by about 2045. More older people in Asia than younger people. Uh, this is historically something we've never faced before. In 20 years' time, half the population of Western Europe is going to be aged over 50, with a life expectancy of another 40 years. Half a region's population between 50 and 90. This is going to uh, require a tremendous change in our institutions. And if we look at the way that our uh, traditional um, pyramid is changing. We have grown up with the idea that we have lots of young people at the bottom, not many uh, people at the top. This is what we saw in uh, the US in 1960. This is the baby boom going through. This is why everyone's getting terribly worried about the aging of the population. This is the success story. This is uh, 2020, uh, and by then, uh, the demography of the US uh, will uh, go into what we call a skyscraper, which means that roughly 10% of each decade of life will be represented by 10% of the population. Sorry, 10 years represented by 10%. We'll have 10% of the population aged 0 to 10, 10%, 10 to 20, and so on. This is actually a success story. It means most people born uh, live long, healthy lives uh, into old age. Why we are concerned at the moment uh, is because of this, is Japan, 1990, nice pyramid. Uh, this is the inverted V that Japan will be facing by 2020. Dramatic falling fertility, increasing longevity, and a real burden at the top. This is the demographic background of the Oxford Institute of Aging. Uh, we look at the global societal and individual aspects of aging. We're very multidisciplinary, there's 25 of us. Uh, we were started in 2001 and we joined the school in 2005. We have philosophers, economists, sociologists, psychologists, um, anthropologists, historians working together to try and understand the implications of this new demography. We work on four broad areas. We look at work, retirement, and economic security, families and communities, health and biodemography and education and technology. And over the last eight years, we've built up networks and regional interests in uh, four regions, Africa, Europe, Latin America, and what's the fourth one? Asia. Sorry, we actually do a lot of work in Asia. <laughs> um, we, we are obviously research driven, but over the years we've um, also put a lot of effort into capacity building. We do a lot of policy work. In fact, the reason I wasn't here was because I was with the uh, Minister for Pensions this morning on a panel with one of the European commissioners trying to persuade the corporate world to understand what this new demography is going to be like for the world of work. Uh, and we also do uh, quite a lot of education programs. We ran a spring school uh, last year uh, where we had, or beginning of this year, where we had 70 individuals from 30 countries and 20 disciplines, all working working together, young researchers trying to get them to understand the implications of population aging. So just to give you an example of the kind of way in which demography and uh, policy can come together, um, this is uh, some work which was done by some economists. Uh, this is looking at the decline in labor participation, and it's been mapped uh, early year. Just look at the blue, that's the 1970s. Later year is the 1990s, mapped for a variety of OECD countries. And you can see the dramatic fall. Let's just take France, men in France, age 60 to 65. In the 1970s, 60% were still in the labor market. That had plummeted down to about 18%. The same for these countries here. Very different, however, for the US and Japan. When we look at pension policy in those countries, one of the really uh, uh, forceful dynamics is that these countries develop pension incentives which encourage people to leave the labor market. 
So the aging population and the demographic issues that we're going to face, uh, demographic challenges we're going to face from those aging populations are as much policy driven as anything else. And the way in which we have really increased that period of retirement, which is what is causing current economic concern, can be shown by some modeling that was done by Kenneth Howes here. This is life expectancy at actual age of retirement in 1970 and 2004. We look at biological increases in longevity and social or economic withdrawal from the labor market. And again, just take this instance of France. You can see that in um, 1970, actual age of retirement meant that men had roughly 11 years of retirement. By 2004, they had about 23 years of retirement. And this is because they're living longer and they're retiring earlier. These are policy issues, and we can work with governments to get them to change that. Another, oh, you haven't, you've um, hidden half my slides. Don't worry, I was going to show you some wonderful slides which show changing dependency ratios in different countries uh, and how um, those dependency ratios, um, how we were working with them. But don't worry, I will now go on to our, our new center. Um, this is, this is the new center that we are, um, have, have set up for the next three years. Um, it's a very multidisciplinary center again, and we have here uh, philosophy, anthropology, um, economics, uh, and statistics uh, represented. Uh, we're about to appoint a new research fellow joint with the Department of Economics. We have co-funding from the YARU initiative, which is the International Association of Research Universities. Uh, and therefore, we have two uh, projects that we'll be working on within this center. Um, the one I'll talk about uh, in, in a minute is the J James Martin Project, which is Extreme Longevity and Declining Fertility, the Redistribution of Resources in Aging Societies, a Policy Challenge. But we're also uh, involved in a six-university collaboration, which is comparing uh, changing um, demography and changing um, policy implications of aging populations uh, in uh, uh, two European and th uh, four Asian countries. And, and we're doing that with some Yaru money. So let me just take you through what our new um, research is going to be on. So the aim of the proposed research is to understand the policy impact of future demographic scenarios and develop methodologies for assessing the sustainability of established social institutions under these scenarios. We're going to be looking at two core issues, intergenerational transfers and what we call the population age wave, and policy making in a climate of extreme demographic development. Now the key assumption behind this is the idea of generational succession. Uh, and the idea of generational succession is that um, our institutions are based on the idea that people grow old and they pass on assets and power and status down through the generations. And these are going to be disrupted in times of extreme longevity. And so that is the fundamental uh, sort of rationale behind um, what we're working on, and in particular, this idea of intergenerational solidarity. And the exciting thing is to get economists and philosophers working on this issue uh, to try and understand its implications. So the first stage of our research is going to be to model a variety of moderate to extreme case demographic scenarios based on the probabilistic approach of Lutz. And the scenarios are persistent low fertility, cycles of fertility boom and fertility bust, and then radical increases in longevity. And the kind of things that Nick and maybe Julian were talking about, uh, where we really can start stretching out longevity. We, we have not only the, the normal uh, life expectancy going to 80, 90, or 100, but we have individuals who are able to live 120, 150, et cetera. And we're very interested in comparing uh, ideas behind um, extension of the normal healthy lifespan and the maximum lifespan for human beings. And there's a subtle difference there, uh, and different dynamics obviously pertain. The second stage of the research will be to explore society's capacity to adjust to changes in population age structure and to assess the adequacy of the available analytical tools to assess the social and economic consequences of demographic development. And then the third stage of the research will be to examine the implication of these scenarios for age-related transfers, intergenerational redistribution, and patterns of generational succession in selected institutions. So we have chosen to do a very specific research project with two or three people uh, over the next three years working on it, but it will fit very much into the overall strategy of the OIA, uh, which I uh, uh, talked about, uh, and we will be linking it in to our broader program of research, education, networking, and dissemination.